I'm going back to old South Haven Where they have the finest beach For that place I have been saving And I hope that they can reach Where everyone is welcome And each one understands They're in South Haven Back in Michigan um, I'm Joan Wendland And I am a writer And I'm also a resident here of South Haven, and I, I came here a little over 10 years ago. And wherever I am, I'm always interested in the history of the place. So I've conducted two creative writing workshops, and out of that have come writer's stories. And so I'm not only interested about the history, but I'm interested in the people's stories that are connected to another place and another time than the one we're in. So that's what we're going to do for you tonight. I know we did this last year and quite a number of people came and so thank you. Thank you all for coming. First of all, we're going to have Sherry Brenner who said her family, she entertained us last year about her family growing up on a farm in Casco and her family had her convinced that she was found under a cabbage patch. <laughs> so, Sherry. The name of my story is The Man with the Arm. As I have mentioned before, I was born December 14th, 1945 at the South Haven Community Hospital. Dr. Penoyer delivered me. He was our family doctor. He liked me until I kicked him in the stomach when he gave me ether to knock me out so he could remove my tonsils. I think I heard about it every time I went to him for something. My parents were Chuck and Jean Cat, and we lived on 109th Avenue on Cedar Bluff Farm in Casco Township. It was a dairy farm that supported two families, my grandparents and our family of five, my siblings, Judy and Kenny. It was slim pickings for money. I was the youngest in the family and I was very gullible. I believed everything I was told. My brother Kenny was only 13 months, we're only 13 months apart but he sure seemed to know a lot more than I did. One day he told me that I was found in a cabbage patch. <laughs> of course, that caused a lot of questions in my mind. <laughs> After that, whenever I saw a cabbage patch, I wondered how many babies were still there that hadn't been found. <laughs> my parents grew cauliflower and cabbage. I worried if there were babies in our own cabbage patch since it was always cold weather when these veggies were cut. I felt very fortunate, though, to have been found by my parents, although it would have been nice if I would have been found by a family that had horses instead of dairy cows. <laughs> At the dinner table, my dad would tell me that every time my elbow bends, my mouth flies open. I spent a lot of time walking around doing this, trying to figure it out. One day at the table, I said, Oh, I get it. <laughs> I enjoyed being in the barn with my dad. When I gave the cows their grain, he would tell me how many scoops each cow would get. They were on the reward system. If they produced a lot of milk, they got more grain. We didn't have a bull on the farm, so we used Michigan State Artificial Insemination Program. There was a chart on the silo door that showed the three positions the cows would do first head to head, second rear to rear, and third, a cow riding on the back of another cow. When they did the third position, it was time to breed the cow that was riding on the back of the other cow. I watched the cows in the barnyard and I'd report to my dad with my hands on my hips. I saw those two cows doing that last picture on the silo door. <laughs> One of them is ready to be bred. I had no idea what I was talking about, but I had heard it before. A sign that said, breed this cow, was always hung over the stanchion of the cow that was to be bred. That was as if my dad wasn't going to be there when the inseminator came. We weren't allowed in the barn when the man with the arm came. That's what my brother and I called him. We had watched from a barn window. It was quite an ordeal. The guy would put one of his arms in a long plastic bag and then put that arm way into the cow's rear end. It was pretty disgusting, I thought. 
I don't know what he was looking for because he never bought anything out of the cow. <laughs> one afternoon, I was in the barn, and there was a calf tied in one of the stanchions. So I hung the sign over that stanchion that said, breed this cow. All my dad said was, you're in the barn today? <laughs> he always had a radio on in the barn, and he listened to WGN. When he wasn't looking, I would change the station to WLS. <laughs> he never said one word to me. He would just put it back on WGN. Then when he wasn't looking, it went back to WLS. <laughs> we did this the whole time I would be in the barn with him. Just my dad and please. Just my dad and I went to see Old Yeller. That was so special. Uh, just to be with him and just him and I and go to a movie. I cried so hard at that movie, I think my dad shed some tears too. Kenny and I fixed up an old wagon. We picked some beans, radishes, and tomatoes out of our garden and put them in this wobbly wagon and pulled it all the way over to Cedar Bluff Park, which was about three quarters of a mile from our house, to hopefully sell some produce to the cottage owners. On the way there, we would talk about what we're going to buy at Van Nights store with all the money we're going to make. Van Nights was where Sunset Junk is now. We sold some green beans and yellow beans. My brother split the money with me. And all the way back home, I would cry, argue, stop my feet, because he had two nickels and I only had a dime. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was sure he had cheated me. Finally, he told me I was stupid and bullheaded, and I did not cheat you. I still wasn't convinced. <laughs> One of my favorite TV shows was Lassie on Sunday evenings. At the time, we had a colleague named Prince, and he was my buddy. I figured Prince could solve problems just like Lassie. One day after school, I decided I was going to run away. I made a peanut butter sandwich and put it in my lunchbox. Prince and I headed to the pasture behind the barn. I always skipped, pretending that I was riding a horse. Every once in a while, I would stop to look for a four-leaf clover so I could wish for a horse. Milo's property edged our property at the end of the pasture, which is probably a quarter mile from the barn. Prince and I crawled under the fence, and I built a shelter on the side of a small pine tree. We crawled into the shelter waiting for someone to come looking for us. It started to get dark and chilly. Suddenly, Prince took off and left me. I stayed for a while crying. Then I decided to go home. It didn't look like anyone was going to come and save me. I walked in the house. Prince met me wagging his tail. My family was eating dinner. I walked in, sat down at the table, and not one person asked me where I had been. <laughs> One day, Prince became missing. My dad went looking for him. I was at Grandma and Grandpa's house worrying about my dog. My dad found him. He had been hit by a car on Blue Star Highway in front of Hilltop Resort. We figured he had gone over to Hilltop to get into their garbage hole. That was my first experience to lose a pet and my best friend. I cried until I ached inside. I blamed the Wheelocks for not burying their garbage. We were fortunate to have grandparents on both sides of the house. We had Grandma Vera, who was my mother's mom. We called her Grandma Vera because we couldn't pronounce Oxenbein. <laughs> Grandma lived in Battle Creek and worked for Kellogg's. When she came to visit, she brought a bag full of the toys you find in cereal. We were the head of by school because we got all those cool things such as a stamp and ink pad that was a spy kit, and the submarines that you put baking soda in them, and they would go underwater. Until the newness was gone, there was usually one of them floating in the bathroom sink. Grandma bought a brand new 61 Studebaker Lark with a manual transmission, which she was used to an automatic transmission with her 53 Buick. When we knew Grandma was coming to visit, Kenny and I would wait patiently by the dining room window for Grandma to drive in and watch her chug along up the driveway. Then we would say, hark, we hear a lark. <laughs> grandma was a neat grandma. She brought me my first petticoat for Christmas one year. It was red with several layers. 
Ken got his first bite from her. She baked the best pecan pie and German chocolate cake. She always brought her Pekingese dog with her, Mimi. She was paper trained. When she had to go to the bathroom, she would go on a candy wrapper if that was the only paper around. <laughs> All of us hated that little black dog, but she was grandma's baby. Grandma would try to quickly pick up Mimi's poop so we wouldn't know about it. I had some ceramic dog poop and I put it on the floor on um, some paper in the kitchen. Grandma walked by and saw it and quickly got some paper, picked it up and headed to the bathroom to flush it. When she turned it over, she saw that it was fake. I heard Grandma say, Sherry? <laughs> now why would she think I was the one who did that? <laughs> then we had Grandma and Grandpa Cat next door to us, Marie and Alice. They, of course, were my father's parents. We ran in and out of their house all the time, usually playing hide and seek. We're always welcome in their home. One time they took us to see the movie Fantasia. This is a big deal because we didn't go to the movies. After the movies, we went to Steiner's restaurant and got a Blue Moon ice cream cone. Almost every April Fool's, I would call Grandpa and tell him his TV antenna had fallen over. <laughs> he would waddle outside and look up at the roof and then waddle back inside. He fell for it every time. <laughs> Quite often, we went in their house and Grandma would be sitting on the stool by the telephone listening to someone else's phone call. <laughs> We had a party line. Ours was three shorts, Grandma's was three shorts and a long, and Compton's was three longs and one short. Grandma answered everybody's, then stayed on the line and listened. Sometimes you would hear her say, Murray, turn that TV down. <laughs> Grandma was really gassy. Sometimes you could hear her pass gas while she was listening in. <laughs> She always sat on a wooden stool, so you know what that was like. <laughs> she, she set her ironing board up next to the phone. It was rare for us to get new clothes, except for uh, just before school. We'd go to the penny store in Allegan and get new saddle shoes, new jeans, socks, etc. That was always an exciting adventure. Our parents always made Christmas, made that Christmas was good. My dad saved newspapers all year round and sold them to Pomeroy's Oil Company. He also packed ap apples for Barton Brothers for extra money. Mother bought our Christmas presents at Gershner's Hardware in Glen when we were little. Christmas Eve became a tradition for all of us. Aunt Dorothy, Mike, and Chuck always joined us from Glen Ellen, Grandma, Grandpa, Cat, and the rest of us. Aunt Lucille, my dad's sister, lived in Oklahoma. She would quite often send us things that she had made. One year, my folks received this large cardboard box from her. They waited to open it when we were all together. My mother was probably afraid to open it. Aunt Lucille was not one of my mother's favorite people. <laughs> we exchanged gifts with everybody. Then the time came to open the mysterious box. The box was carefully opened, and inside were four boob headdress pillows that she had made. One for my dad, one for Monty, one for Kenny, and one for my brother-in-law, Alan. Each one was a different color made from fake fur. Now try to visualize this. Close your eyes if you want to. One was hot pink with yellow nipples. One was white with pink nipples. One was yellow with blue nipples. And one was blue with orange nipples. They were made so you laid your head in between the boobs. <laughs> Everyone just cracked up about these headdress except mother. <laughs> she thought they were disgusting. <laughs> Kenny and I were laughing so hard we could hardly walk or talk. When mother, when mother wasn't in the room, Kenny and I would line them up on the back of the couch. <laughs> that was a sight to see. When mother saw them, she would have a fit. Get those things off the couch. She would quickly remove them. When she left the room, we put them back up on the couch. <laughs> we did this to mother several times just to tease her. 
When Aunt Lucille passed away, Mother, myself, and my sister Judy went to Tulsa to take care of things. My dad was gone by then. We had her cremated and had a nice funeral at her church for her friends. When we were packing the car to return home, Judy and I put Aunt Lucille's ashes in the back seat. My mother said, I am not riding back there with her. <laughs> so Aunt Lucille rode to Michigan in the trunk of my car. <laughs> Some history about my family. My great-grandfather, Myron B. Cat, built a resort called Cedar Bluff Resort. It was on Adams Road in Casco Township. It, was housed, it housed 150 people and was on Lake Michigan. Myron and his son Murray were proprietors of the resort. This resort burned in 1914. Myron then had a contract with the state to haul gravel up from the beach with horses to gravel Blue Star Highway, which was one of the only hard surface roads in the area. After a few years, Myron sold the property to Doc and Jess McCormick, and they built Dixie Inn, which was a dance hall. Myron then developed Cedar Bluff Park. He told the people he would build them a cottage and furnish them with water. Monty and I own some of the property that is left in the park, the well service, uh, Lake Bluff, etc. We're the fourth generation to own this. I'm still friends with the Tobin family that had and still do have a cottage in the park. Mary Tobin, Mary, <laughs> likes to tell me that two of her brothers thought I was hot. <laughs> but that is because I was the only girl in the park that wasn't related to them. Monty and I have been married 53 years this summer. We met on the school bus, and I didn't like him because he would just sit and stare at me. When he got a car, he stalked me. My parents wouldn't let me go out with him because they thought he was a hoodlum. <laughs> he proved himself different, and my parents loved him like a son. We have two children, Heidi Turchin and Vince Brenner. My pride and joy, including my horse, is our three grandchildren, Parker, Carly, and Carson. And I told him I was going to make him stand, but I won't do that. <laughs> we live on 21 acres across the road from Cedar Bluff Park. We call our place Cedar Bluff Ranch. <laughs> now, some of the people did not write their stories, did not want to write them, but people like Paul Curie was willing to tell me his story. And it actually, it came about because Karen Curie, his wife, said, you know, if you're interested in history, she gave me a whole packet of very interesting information, but if you want to know more, talk to Paul. So I did. But what I became interested in was Paul's story with his father. And so out of my conversation with him, I wrote this piece. And it's called Sundays with Paul and his father. It was a simpler time. No heads dipped over cell phones, no texts, emails, or Facebook. Just a father and his son and their German shepherd Duke on most Sundays of the year. Doug Curie was the father. Paul Curie is the son. Paul is a quiet man, a thoughtful listener who serves or has served on all sorts of local boards in the village government, including the Planning Commission and the Zoning Board of Appeals. It's been said about him, he may be quiet, but when he speaks, it would be wise to listen. He has a lot to say. So I listened to what he had to say while we took a drive. During the 50s, most Sundays, except for hot summer ones, Paul and his father and their German Shepherd Duke went for a walk in the woods. Talked about the terrain and the surroundings. He said there was a lot of quiet time. His father, like Paul, was a quiet man. Paul said they would drive, and then his father would suddenly stop, and they would take off through the woods all morning long for four to five hours. No phones ringing interrupting conversation, no checking email, no cell phone ringing from a pocket, just a father and his son and a walk in the woods. In winter, sometimes cross-country skiing. They explored everything north of 16th Avenue. 
through the woods to the river bottom where the Black River was so narrow you could jump across and shallow enough to wade across at 18th Avenue Conservancy, to the pools of teeming carp that swam upstream to spawn. These were the native carp, not the Asian <laughs> carp that we're trying to invade, they were trying to invade. Paul said they were so thick he could see the river bottom. Or one time, big blue racer snakes were sunning themselves. Now, neither of these sites are a real fond recollection. They hiked the Van Buren State Park dunes and hills, and whether that trip or another, it was almost always ended in a bonfire and a hot dog roast. Just the wieners, no buns. And Duke shared in the walk. They always came home with an empty package. He said everything from Deer Lick to Pilgrim Haven and the dunes was a unique neighborhood. It used to be all fruit orchards, like peaches. And from 1866 to 1878, it was owned by the Ludwig family, who were big in shipping at the time. Much of that same land is now fully developed with, with homes instead of fruit trees. There was an old swimming hole where Paul finally learned to swim. He said his parents spent a load of money on swimming lessons for him with no success. He said he always sank like a rock. Until the old swimming pool. He was there with friends, not this time. He, he was with his, not with his father. He and his friends biked over a road that was sand, part gravel, part chip stone. Not an easy ride for a bike. At the old swimming hole, he jumped in. He went down for the second time. And remembered, if you went down for the third, that was it. He started swimming out of self-preservation. <laughs> when he shared this with his father, his father said, well, that's where he learned how to swim, too. <laughs> it was called Sandy Beach then. Now it's called the Golden Dreams Campgrounds and it's enclosed by fencing. As we drove around, he pointed out one old one-room schoolhouse still in existence on 68th. He said those stories that people tell about walking five or six miles to school are simply not true. He said there was a schoolhouse every two miles. He did say he thought he was the only one that could honestly stay. He walked uphill both ways. And he showed me both hills. <laughs> His father also told of a, a Nazi influence in South Haven. Now, I couldn't find any historical reference to this, but I thought it was important to include as part of their talks. His father said Alfred, uh, Albert Speer, the architect of the Third Reich and also part of the Nazi elite, visited here. During the Nuremberg trials, instead of a life, life sentence or death that others got, he received a 20-year prison sentence because he claimed he didn't know anything about the death camps. He was just an architect of buildings. He took notes that became part of his book, Inside the Third Reich. Also, Gearing, the commander of the Luftwaffe, visited here. His father told him that when World War II stepped up, they had to return to Germany. Paul said he knew his father was a truthful man. So I, I would go along with what he said about uh, this Nazi influence. But his father said, if you tell a lie, then you always have to remember what the lie was. If you tell the truth, you don't have to make it up. Well, so was this visit by Nazis something that only the older generation knew, or was it a rumor? You know, maybe some of you out in the audience know and want to share, you know, later after we finish the program. Now, his father was a rather gruff man, a man of no compliments, no I love yous, or a job well done. But he cared about his only son. When Paul came out of Central School, his father pointed to the high school athletic field, which was one way, and his father's job site was the other way, and he said, you'll learn a lot more from me than if you stay with me than with, his, with sports. Instead of sports, he gave Paul a work ethic, and he was meticulous. He taught Paul what he knew about body work to the point that he told Paul at 16. Paul knew as much as the other men he employed in his body shop, but his father couldn't pay him as much as it wouldn't be fair to the other employees. He said sometimes they would be at work half hour before anybody else, and they'd just sit down and talk or go to breakfast. 
During these times and other times, Paul got the father and son speech. I want you to be whatever you want to be, but be good at it. Well, when Paul started working for Canoni Construction, he said most people were afraid of Mr. Canoni. But Paul said Mr. Canoni was thrilled to have him. He knew Paul's work ethic was handed down to him by his father. As Paul said, it was a pretty neat thing having this special relationship with his father. And Paul seems to be guided as much by what his father said as by the demonstration of his father's life. He was 10 or 11 when they started. And in some circle of life sort of moment, after Doug Curie retired and Paul was still working, Paul would stop by and pick up his father and take him to the job site. Many things have changed now. Paul's father is no longer here. His father's old house is undergoing a major remodel. But Paul and his wife, Karen, still live in South Haven as their parents did before them. The fields we passed are now corn and soybeans. When they used to be, used to be pasture, then it went into grain and fruit orchards. And of course, blueberries. By 1950s, San Stanley Johnson brought blueberries to South Haven. The ground was worth more in blueberry production. Probably the only thing that is the same are the goldenrod and the blue chicory blooming on the roadside and Paul's memories of Sundays with his father. Ah. Really, uh, a group of stories wouldn't be complete of, about South Haven without blueberry picking. So Sandy McCash is going to entertain you with that. I was born and raised in South Haven on the 400 block of South Haven Street, and I was the youngest of four girls. My father was a commercial fisherman on the LCJ, the fishing tug owned by Jensen's Fishery, and my mother was a stay-at-home mom. That is, she stayed at home until berry ripening, ripening season. Then, she and her daughters went to work, picking various types of berries at several berry picking locales. The season would start with gooseberries at Cole's Berry Farm, then raspberries at Bertarelli's Farm, then back to Cole's Farm for blueberries, and ending the season at the Grand Champs for their late ripening blueberries. The farmers would pick us up early in the morning, the air cool and the grass wet with dew, and off we'd go for the day. We girls would be sleepy and cold as we cuddled together in the back of a pickup truck for our ride to the fields. I was too young to pick berries when my mother first started us on our summer working in the fields career. So I had to stay up near the packing shed and entertain myself throughout the day. The days were long and hot, and I spent hours watching the clouds and birds and entertaining myself with my imagination. My berry-picking sisters envied my labor-free position. <laughs> but as years passed, I was in the fields as well. Those long, hot hours of picking berries, the bushes picked clean and inspected by the farmer to ensure there were no berries left behind. Potty breaks were in outhouses that we referred to as hoot nannies. <laughs> Sears and Montgomery Ward catalogs were there for your reading pleasure and for hygiene. Uh, murderous thorns on blueberry and raspberry bushes, huge long-legged black and yellow spiders lurking in the bushes, and the occasional blue racer snake slithering across the pathway as you headed for the hootenanny were occupational hazards. Often, if the snake went by, you just didn't make it to the hoot nanny. <laughs> <laughs> the ride home at quitting time in the back of the pickup was truly a pickup for us with the relief of the cool breeze on our dirty, hot, and sweaty bodies. We'd often run the four blocks to the Blue Stairs on Monroe Boulevard after the, father, uh, the farmer deposited us, deposited us home, racing down to the beach and across the sand to the cool, refreshing water it was often our bath for the day. The reward for all of our hard work at the end of the summer was our annual trip to Benton Harbor to buy school clothes. We'd get dressed in our best seersucker shorts and tank tops and walk down to Arkins to catch the Greyhound bus. 
I can still remember the nausea as from the diesel exhaust as we waited to board for our exciting day spent in downtown Benton Harbor. We'd shop the local department stores and enjoy an egg salad sandwich for lunch at the counter at Woolworths. It was a thrill. Not all of our summer was spent in the fields though. Before picking season, we would spend weeks at Bible schools at different locales. We loved the singing and the crafts and my mother loved the fact that she had several hours without four squabbling girls. <laughs> we also spent time at Monroe Park, now called Kids Corner, making crafts, playing marble games, and playing on the merry-go-round swings and monkey bars. Nearly every day we went to the beach, dragging our big black inner tubes, the ones with the patches and the nozzles that always left a dandy of a scratch on your belly or your arm when one of your sisters knocked you off. We'd, we'd get horrible sunburns and blister to a crisp in the sun and spend the evening peeling one another's backs. <laughs> Days that we stayed at home were spent in the backyard building tents over clotheslines, playing games, red light and green light, mother may I, having gunny sack races. We were primed by the 4th of July when Phoenix Street was closed off between <coughs> Center and Kalamazoo Streets for street races where we'd compete and I'd often win ribbons. There was a blueberry pie eating co contest as well, where I often gobbled my way to victory. <laughs> Those summer days were heavenly. Winter days, they were spent sledding and skating at Bear Park. And without my mother's knowledge, sledding down the dunes off Monroe Boulevard, across the frozen sand, over the fro frozen bumpy waves of the lake. The lake would freeze way past the pier and we'd walk way out over the water. We'd walk along the pile barriers on South Beach and climb the frozen icy dunes, the branches of the bushes and the sand grasses creating ice castles around and over us. It was dangerous, but we loved it and even managed to live through it. My father had his own adventurous winter stories of the LCJ getting stuck in the ice and his walks across the frozen lake to town for liquid refreshments for him and the crew members as they waited for the icebreaker to rescue them. They had to keep warm and keep the blood flowing. <laughs> These are about a few of my memories of growing, in South ha growing up in South Haven. I feel so lucky to have grown up in such a beautiful, charming town on this glorious, beautiful lake in a time that was so much simpler and peaceful. As I walked around uh, South Haven, I collected a few, I call them snippets, so it's not, it's not a longer piece, um, uh, I, but I, they were just too good. I couldn't pass up um, sharing them with you. So these are just based on conversations of people that um, I had conversations with, like June Adams. I don't know whether you're, June is here? No, not tonight. Okay, well she told me that uh, one day she took her young children down to the docks to watch the ships unload. She was 21 at the time and she had three young children and she drove her hand-me-down husband's 1957 Ford convertible. Now ships from many different countries came to South Haven. This particular ch ship was docked a little to the west of where the idler now stands. One of the men from the ship, a Dane, she thought, by his accent, wanted something and through a break in the language barrier found he wanted her to take him to buy alcohol. She did a quick calculation in her mind and knew she didn't want him to take the car with her three young children. She, on the impulse, she handed him the keys and said, here, you take it and go buy what you want. <laughs> the state liquor store at the time was right across from where the village market now stands. She waited and waited. He didn't come back and didn't come back. She was getting worried and didn't know what to do. At that moment, he drove up with a trunk full of liquor and the back seat of the convertible with the top down, with stacked to the top with more booze. She said it was years before she told her husband what she had done. <laughs> Here's a little anecdote about uh, Sherman Dairy, Sherman Dairies. Uh, just a little quick background on them. Uh, Grandpa Sherman of Sherman Dairy started the business back in 1916 
and he delivered milk with a horse-drawn wagon from house to house around South Haven, supplied by a small herd of dairy cattle. He passed it on to his son, Rupert, who in turn passed it to his boys. One of the boys, Port, wanted to make something good tasting that would make people happy, like ice cream. Port bought his brothers out, stopped bottling milk, started making just ice cream. Now, according to Jerry Sherman, who's, I see him at the senior center, and he told me this little anecdote. He's the last surviving brother of the Sherman Brothers Dairies, and he said, the town father's reaction to the establishment of Sherman's Dairy Bar was, who do those dumb farmers think will come to buy an ice cream cone from them? <laughs> and of course, you know, success was the best revenge. Now, Roger Ransom, who I don't know if any of you saw the wonderful uh, um, Reader's Theater this last weekend, but he provided all of the music uh, for that, and, uh, and he has, you know, does around town. But he told me one of his favorite memories is Black River in the late 40s and early 50s. He learned to water ski there and had boat races there with small boats from the lighthouse to the yacht club. If they wanted to come ashore, they just tied up the boat. When they came back, there would be no concerns about someone having taken it. And he took swimming lessons on the beach. Now, his family established Ransom Brothers Painting, which still exists today, but Roger took another detour from the family business, and he worked for IBM until he retired. He further remembers that the first tourists here were called the resorters, and they looked down on the locals. Now he plays a smooth, smooth piano, so he plays not only at the Reader's Theater but around town, so if you have a chance and you haven't heard him, please do so. Now I love, I don't know if all of you have read um, the, the wonderful Apple Yard books, and I, you know, I go back to them from time to time because they just have such wonderful history. And I just took a couple of snippets out of, out of um, the South Haven sen Sentinel because it just shows how far we've come, I think. <laughs> March 12th, 1879, a Dr. A.J. Holmes, he was a dentist of South Haven, pulled an aching tooth out of one of our citizens. So far, all right, he pulled many, but this particular tooth was pulled, cleaned, and placed back in the cavity and is now as sound as any tooth. He does, it doesn't show that it was ever free from its original fastenings. So it's like, you know, he was, he was ahead of his time. They do this now. <laughs> um, December 15th, 1893. Skating is a fad now with the young folks. The ice up the river is several inches thick, so there need be no fear. We understand that a good many young ladies will join the ranks of skaters this year. We have only words of commendation for the sport indulged in discreetly. <laughs> a word to the, the, la the young ladies. And this one is just too good to not share. February 28, 1874, Mr. V.W. Hay Hayward married Miss Caroline Wilson, whose people live east of Pawpaw, married on April 19, 1873, taking her to their future home in Matawan. On the 16th of that month, he traded her to George Kessler of Papa for a watch and a violin. <laughs> Aren't we glad that things have changed? <laughs> uh, I, I'm next up. I'm going to have Marietta um, relate some stories that. Um, Marge Norman and Dixie Caps told me in conversation. Marge and Dixie Caps are cousins, both born and raised here, though Marge moved to California as an adult for a time before moving back to South Haven. Dixie was really lucky because she got to go to school right here in this building, Hartman. Imagine South Haven with no Walmart, no Walgreens, no Myers, no Village Market. Imagine instead little neighborhood grocers a number of them. This was in the days of one-car families. Women would walk to the neighborhood store. Each had their own fresh meat market as well as canned goods and other grocery items. There was a grocer where the taste restaurant is now, and 
also a grocery at the part, a part of the clo now closed McDonald's drugstore. Another one was where the Foundry Hall building was. Each of the factories along Elkenberg had a nearby grocer where the factory workers would go for lunch. The factories and the grocers are gone except for the, for the A&D one-stop Elkenberg. They forgot one store, the little Tragna store on the corner of <laughs> Eagle Street. <laughs> Grandpa sold, um, what do you call those, import items? <laughs> a lot of olive oil. <laughs> the, the Bauer family also had a little grocery on Phoenix, where Dixie Cap's mother shopped once a week. Families had an account and charged the groceries. Payment was due every Saturday payday. When Dixie was 14 or 15, she went in to buy a package of cigarettes, ostensibly for her father, she charged them, of course, to the family account, then ducked behind Fred Nelson's house for a smoke. But someone squealed on her. Her father said, if you're going to smoke, then let me teach you how it's done. Ha <laughs> ha. He instructed her to take a deep breath and really suck it in. It burned like crazy. That's what she said anyway. <laughs> That's how you smoke them, she said. That's not how I do it, but it turned her off of any more cigarettes until she was in her 20s. <laughs> Farmer's Market was produce sold from horse-drawn wagons, horse-drawn plows. Also, they also plowed the streets of snow. According to Dixie, the red barn with the house painted on it on Park Avenue is still there where they stabled the horses. An older generation of women and some men worked in the canning factory. Marge's grandma, Norman, was one of them. They were the senior citizens of the day. They also worked in the laundry located at Kalamazoo and Huron. They did the resort linens. Doors were kept open to the sidewalk. No air conditioning in those days. Dixie's dad delivered the clean laundry to the resorts. It was it was a city of factory workers and fishermen on the one side and the professionals, lawyers, and doctors and other prominent people on the other. It was a soft line, but there nonetheless. Marge and Dixie's mothers would not have been invited to join the, the Scott Club, for example. It was for the wives of prominent people. One had to be sponsored, and the wives only sponsored like-minded wives. Students often went to Louis after school. It was across from the old Central School. The school are lofts now. They served their, ap their famous advertised Jenny's Famous Hamburgers. <laughs> Louis was known for his very loud and slow, thank you, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Dixie had her first date in kindergarten with Jim Turner. She went went to a movie at the Golden Brown Bakery, which was a movie theater then that showed westerns. Mind you, our movie theaters used to change three times a week. <laughs> Later, Marge worked as an usher and a cashier at the theater, as did many other 12 and 13-year-old early teens. Marge Norman later worked as a telephone operator. The phone company was where the Irish store is on Phoenix today. They had to make out charge tickets for every call. If the caller recognized the operator's voice, they sometimes got a free call. <laughs> In the 40s, Dixie lived on Congress Street and remembers looking down on the campfires of the hobos that rode the trains who camped there. In late 40s, some of the visitors at Sleepy Hollow would hire adult women at 75 cents an hour to babysit. But they would hire the early teenagers to babysit their kids for 25 cents an hour. <laughs> the village market offices on Center and Huron was the Janus Hotel, beautiful marble lobby with mineral baths that created a pleasant fragrance all over town. I didn't think it was pleasant. <laughs> <laughs> the electric generating plant where the water filtration plant is now blew a whistle to alert the town when there was a fire. A certain pattern of whistles further identified what ward the fire was in. Marge Norman and Dixie Caps took dance lessons from the age of three through high school from Joyce Springett, 
on Monroe Street. Her mother, Mrs. Springett, took the money and designed costumes, made patterns out of newspapers just by looking at each person without taking measurements. As they got older, around 10, they taught tap for free lessons and for a free lunch. Joyce's mother made ground up bologna and homemade dill pickles for sandwiches. <laughs> they were great. <laughs> also, Marge recounts that the senior class voted not to go to Washington, D.C because the black students would not be able to stay in the same hotel. They said they had one or two black kids in class, but they did everything together and did not experience any of the animosity of the 50s, according to Marge and Dixie's perspectives. Resident, oh, Marge, requ Marge recalls in fifth grade that many blacks class of students would bring in pennies or nickels for war bond books to contribute to World War II war effort. Campfire girls collected fat and little wagons, also for the war effort. Shortages of butter and oils began early in the war. Most cooking oils came from the Pacific Islands, conquered by the Japanese, and the supply plummeted. Fats were also needed in higher quantities for industrial and military use. For example, the Navy used lard to grease their guns. South Haven played a major role in the war. Overton's factory made gun stocks, Bon Aluminum made pistons. Mother, Marge's mother worked the night shift, and during the war, they had to be certain that the blackout curtains fully covered the windows. A warden would walk the streets to make sure all windows were covered. Later, residents established Victory Gardens behind what is now the depot. Every night, they would pull weeds and water the plants. Dixie tells of her nephew, who worked for the Nichols Hotel. He said, there is a narrow passage hidden behind a wall that leads to the garage, leading one to suppose what it was used for. Was this part of the Al Capone lore that floats around town? <laughs> Maybe some of you know. Uh, one of the uh, interviews that I did was uh, uh, with uh, Gus Baldoff. And I was put in touch with him because he is the son of the caretaker of the old Baum Mansion, which was part of Doctor's Row. I don't know whether any of you have heard of that. But anyway, I had a fascinating uh, time with him. I, I met uh, Gus and his wife, Dora. Uh, on a recent summer day at his home on Jones Avenue. Now, his given first name is Ludwig, but he's known as Gus. He lived in the mansion from his birth in 1926 until the family moved when he was 15 in 1941. He's 90 years old now, trim, fit, with a sharp mind that captured memories of the old Baum mansion as if it were now, not then. He also shared several black and white albums. In fact, he told me he brought one of the albums with him tonight. So, uh, you know, when the program is over and you want to talk with him and perhaps look at the photo albums that he brought with him, uh, it will be a real treat. Now, there are other written accounts of the Baum Mansion, but this conversation that I had, I'm confining this to the conversation I had with Gus and his recollections. Dr. Wilhelm Baum, a heart specialist from Chicago, had a three-story townhouse in the city, but built the South Haven Mansion in the early 1920s. Other Chicago doctors bought property and built their own mansions along the lake, um, adjacent to and north of Dr. Baum's, hence the name that has stuck to this day of Doctor's Row, instead of his actual name, which is 77th Street. Dr. Baum named the mansion Longcroft, but it was commonly called the big house. It was large, elongated with 20 or more rooms, made of stucco, stacked with 11 people, which included a butler, cooks, and chambermaids. Gus's mother was a sometimes cook. Dr. Baum was known as the Commodore of the Big Lawn, which extended west from 77th Street to the mansion, which sat on the bluff overlooking Lake Michigan. 
And to give you some perspective, I was told that's about a football field in length. So picture 77th Street, football field in length, <coughs> up to the mansion door. Commodore was a title from his sailing days in the Chicago and Mackinac races. He held the record for 71 years. Now Gus's father, Joseph Baldoff, was the caretaker and landscaper of the property. Joseph was born in Austria and worked for the owners of a castle. And the castle stands to this day, Gus said, as a bed and breakfast. He learned landscaping there. Now, post-World War I was a very revolutionary time, a time of gang activity and economic uncertainty when a wheelbarrow full of money would only buy a loaf of bread. He contacted his brother in Chicago who sent him a ticket to the United States. He pulled into the New York Harbor on the 4th of July, 1924. He rode the train from New York to Chicago, and he spoke only German at first, and he ordered food by indicating what he wanted by whatever the person before him had. But he learned to speak English without an accent, according to Gus, because he felt he should speak the language of the, of the country that he was in. Now, in one of those serendipitous lucky moments in life, his brother found a job position in a Chicago newspaper working for Dr. Baum in Michigan, and his father was hired. He resided in the caretaker's house, which was a spacious three to four bedrooms upstairs and two more downstairs, along with a kitchen, dining room, and living room. The big house had a screened-in porch and French doors that overlooked the lake. During the 1920s and 30s, the beach was wide and sandy, about 100 yards out to the water. And again, it's approximately the football field in length. Can you imagine our short little beaches now and having that wide of a beach out to the water? Unbelievable. Gus said there was a driveway and steps that led down to the beach. They had a large yacht, which later burned, and he showed me pictures of the, in the album of the yacht burning as it floated on the lake. There was a gazebo type structure above the water for lookouts and tea. Gus said it was a beautiful beach and recalls many summer days playing on the beach and beach combing for wooden flo floats from the fishermen's nets. The picture showed a dune area devoid of growth where tall trees and dense foliage now stand. All of this was in the the 40s and 50s before the erosion of the banks. Now the 32 acre property included a tennis court that was later converted into a formal gardens. There was a huge greenhouse. Goldfish in the water lily pond wintered over in the greenhouses. There was a garage for the Packard limo, the mansion, and the ice house. Every winter a pond near De Grand Champs froze over. Blocks of ice were cut and stored in the ice house and covered with sawdust. The refrigerators of the day were known as ice boxes, with food cooled by the blocks of ice. And when the, they needed more ice, they cleaned off the sawdust and put in a fresh block. And I remember my grandmother, uh, to the, uh, I always wondered why she called it the ice box. She always had a refrigerator, and she always kept calling it the ice box. Now, according to a separate account, it was a formal time of garden parties on the grounds, Ladies wore chiffon dresses with horse hair braided picture hats and long white gloves. Gentlemen wore navy blazers, white flannel trousers, and straw boaters. Servants passed hors d'oeuvres and drinks on silver trays. They did have electricity for light, but the doctors were deemed important residents, so the electric lines ran that far, but farms inland still used kerosene lamps for light. And according to Gus, that existed for quite some time. My father planted anything he planted, it grew, is what Gus said. He landscaped the area with many areas with trees that exist to this day. He was known to go to Chicago horticultural shows with his little knife and surreptitiously cut <laughs> <laughs> snip cuttings from plants and bring them back and make them grow. He also poured the many sidewalks that went all through the formal gardens he had landscaped with dahlias and hydrangeas, among others. Gus's father poured the driveway around the entire property as well as the one great sidewalk that extended from 77th Street West up to the front door 
of the mansion. He said the bombs wanted to be able to walk all around the grounds without getting their shoes wet or dirty. Barberry bushes and rose bushes lined the sidewalk on both sides, and the black and white pictures showed huge rose bushes with what looked like dinner plate sized blossoms. During Prohibition, his father planted a vineyard, and the grapes produced wine. The chauffeur, Fritz Gerber, had suitcases specially built to conceal the bottles of wine. Then he loaded the suitcases on top of the limo to take to Chicago. It was a four-hour ride with a poor heater that required blankets for passengers during cool weather. A ravine ran through the property, and a farm existed on the other side. Are we okay? <laughs> Hear the crackling? There were three bridges across the creek, across the creek and the ravine, as well as pathways through the woods. None of those exist today. The creek was so deep they could can canoe on it, as well as ice skate in the winter. There was a smokehouse, horses and cows and chickens, and the latter of which supplied milk, eggs, and, and, uh, and cream. There was a pump for the creek water as well as a big water tank from, for Lake Michigan water, all of which was used for irrigation. His father admonished, don't ever, ever climb the water tank. So of course he did. <laughs> They did have a filtration system for the water that was used for drinking and bathing. There was a big mound on the property. They were told it was an Indian burial ground. And though the kids dug it many times, they never found anything. In the 1920s, Dr. Baum purchased a German police dog from Germany for $2,000, which, you know, very tidy sum now and then. Gus said Troller, the dog, only understood German but became his babysitter as he resided in the caretaker's house with Gus and his family. He said if his father told him to stay and watch over Gus, the dog would not move until told to, told to do so. Troller is buried on the property near the Spanish villa. Now, Valino, the Spanish villa, was built in 1924. Gus's father excavated the site with a horse-drawn scoop in preparation for the concrete foundation. According to Gus, this is a place for Mrs. Baum to have tea. And the black and white pictures showed one great room with a beautifully tiled floor and sculptures, potted plants, and a chaise lounge. She was there so often, Dr. Baum built a bedroom addition. According to a separate account, many of the furnishings were ordered and shipped from Europe. And one of the accounts I read was that um, on one of the, the Baum's visits to uh, Europe, to Holland, the, the country, not <laughs> Holland, Michigan, one summer, they became acquainted with the queen. They invited her to spend the next summer, which she accepted. In anticipation of the, 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 of the visit, the villa was constructed halfway between the caretaker's house and the main house. According to this count, account, she never came, and the Baums were very disappointed. Gus said he's read this account, but from his own recollection, he could not confirm the story. But one additional thing, as a kid, he loved to roller skate, and he sk roller skated all over the sidewalks, <laughs> including around this villa. Now, his metal roller skates rolling over the concrete bothered Mrs. Baum while she was in the villa, so she bought him roller skates with rubber wheels. <laughs> Mrs. Baum was considered a socialite. They traveled to Europe every year and stayed for a month or two and visited many dignitaries. In Germany, they had dinner with Joseph Goebbels, Hitler's close associate and Reich Minister of Propaganda. Gus's father said it was good Mrs. Baum passed away before World War II. Her visitors would have caused her to be politically suspect. She was 100% socialite, according to Gus, not political, but in 1932, the Japanese delegation from the Chicago World's Fair visited along with Hitler's youth corps and their parents. Gus said they were very arrogant, and his father told him to stay away when they were visiting. Gus said he rode his tricycle all over the sidewalks and driveways of the grounds so much he wore out the tires on his tricycle. <laughs> and when the Baums went to Europe for the summer, 
Gus's father invited the neighborhood kids to bring their tricycles and ride all over the grounds and go canoeing in the lake. Ironically, Dr. Baum, the heart specialist, died of a heart attack in 1932. Sadly, by 1977 and 78, the big house was just a few feet from the edge of the bluff. The owner, Don Cleveland, requested the fire department burn it down. The only original structures that remain are the caretaker's house on 77th Street and the Spanish villa on Fire Lane D. The current owner of the villa has maintained the integrity of the one large great room and only added a kitchen in one area. The 32 acre grounds that still exist, but are, it's now known as Winding Creek Estates, and that were, they were developed by Don Brashler and Don Cleveland. Gus is very proud of two items that came from the mansion that are in his house. There's a quarter sawn oak table in the corner of his living room, and I could feel its heft and weight as I tried to lift a corner. He said it would take two men and a small boy to lift it. And there's a great chair in his home, which is also part of the mansion. There is one thing that has not changed. Gus is still riding a bike a recumbent bike this time, and you may see him biking all around South Haven. And I'm going to take you on a little train ride in South Haven. It's a 1940s perspective. In the 1940s, South Haven was best known for summers filled with people and more people, boarding houses, resorts, cottages, fruit-laden orchards that bordered our little town of trees, trees, trees. Yes, a profusion of stately trees. Remember how Phoenix Street was brimmed full of trees? It was like a royal canopy that welcomed visitors to South Haven back then. South Haven had a texture of being just a three-stop sign town then. But beyond the three-stop signs, slightly west, was the jewel of this quiet town a free, sandy-shored beaches of our Lake Michigan. My neighborhood, Eagle Street, sits on the edge of our bustling downtown shops. Eagle Street still soars above the Black River where the Lower South Side Marina is now located. During the 40s, the terrain leading to the river from Eagle Street was quite different. There were stairs that led to two terrace levels of the hill that went down to the river. From the top of the stairs, you could see the river's shore dotted with fishermen's nets, all tidy on their drying racks. The most real mischief our block kids got into was going down there and messing up the nets. Those stairs were there for, for the, the stairs were there where 60 or more children of Eagle Streets, it became their outlet to the two sets of railroads tracks that resided there. One set of tracks laid on the first level down towards the river. They wound round and round past the side streets along Maple Street. As the trains entered the town, we would see those tracks as they came from Blue Star Highway on past to the present courthouse and finally approached the bridge area and then on past McGuire's aroma-filled coffee house store. At this point, the trains often stopped at the River Bridge site to pick up lumber, coal, and even gravel. Those big ships carried, carried all of that all across Lake Michigan. Some of those ships came from very great distances. As a kid, I danced in the bowels of one of them. <laughs> but if my mother knew I'd done that, I got killed. <laughs> Some of the ships came from great distances, as I said. The tracks continued around McGuire's and up the hill, finally reaching Phoenix and Kalamazoo Street, where it finally spit, split to two sets of tracks under the terraced area of the side of my street. Those top-level tracks went around to the side of the American Legion. Remember the World War I cannon that resided there? The tracks continued down the side streets of Maple Street. That was the last evidence of those tracks lay in the grassy divides on Maple Street. The track meandered down the streets to behind the old Overton factories. Those track sites became part of our new walking bike trails. 
the tracks continued onto the backyards of the long gone Everett Piano Factory <coughs> and National Motors. It continued on into the industrial area and then back across Blue Star Highway to I don't know where. <laughs> However, it was the tracks that rolled past the American Legion that were such an attraction to us Eagle Street kids. One of those great summer days, a small group of us kids were playing on the south side of the tracks when suddenly a train came barreling around the curve and soon to be on to us. You see, the trains could not be heard until the train completed the curve toward the Legion and then on us. We were very frightened and began to run and scamper up onto the wall next to the tracks. The wall was covered with thorny rose bushes cutting pinching and pricking all of us. I fell down, and when I tried to get up, I couldn't. My skirt was caught in the tracks. My buddy Michael, who was a very small six-year-old, tumbled back down off the wall and dragged me off the track, leaving my multi-covered skirt on the tracks. There was no time to climb the wall. Mike and I stood there scared to death as he pressed me against the wall. As flat as we could get, the train roared its way past us. It stunk terrible, and to this day, I can still smell it in my mind. My hero, Michael, stood in front of me all the way home. He dared the others not to laugh at me in my underwear. <laughs> I don't remember what happened to my skirt. Mike Virgo died as a very young man. He saved my life, and ever since then, I have never met a Michael that I did not like. <laughs> now for a sweeter memory on the, of those tracks. Are you ready? It was us kids laughing and laughing at pennies on the tracks being smashed flat as we watched the old trains passing by. What a thrill it was. What a special thrill it was when the train's engineer would toot the horn at us. The second set of split tracks ran adjacent to the river where there were towering warehouses that blocked our view of the river. Many of the kids used to love to sneak into the warehouses and walk on top of the pyramid-shaped piles of lumber. The fun was short-lived when one summer fun-filled day was interrupted, interrupted with sad news that a young eight-year-old, Richard Lankied, had died in one of the warehouses. A pyramid of lumber collapsed on him, and he was caught upside down. He was my fair-haired classmate. Still to this day, I pray for him. The tracks next to the warehouses were full of tar, and on those really blistering days, it stuck to our feet. Why walk the, tra the tracks, you wonder? Now, come on. Have any of you ever seen kids in the olden days pass up a chance to balance on any rail of tracks? Aha, <laughs> uh -huh, yes. I fell there, too. <laughs> my mom had a terrible time of getting the tar out of my long hair. And to this day, I can also smell the gasoline mama used to get the tar out of my former banana curls. <laughs> the reward of emerging from those tracks was landing on our coveted South Beach. We would spend our allowances and get treats at the old ice cream stand. It still makes us locals sad that that landmark is gone but not the yucky, yucky bathrooms that were attached to it. <laughs> Sweltering summer days encouraged us kids to follow ice trucks as they delivered huge pieces of ice to people who still had ice boxes. My grandma Tragna used to call hers an ice -a box -a. <laughs> I would be willing to bet that the drivers of the ice trucks deliberately left us large, broken, falling pieces of ice. Summers were not just filled with beach days. We would race through huge round pipes that were laid from the ravine where the city hall is now. Ravines traversed the city in many locations, and some still do. Those ravines were like ready-made adventurous playgrounds. One of the ravine pipe tunnels ran three blocks, starting from where city hall stands today, ending up all the way to the, under the old Bear Park. Over that area of the ravine, were one of the many old metal bridge walks that were scattered all over ravines leading to other streets. But next to that old bridge walk was the famous rock boulder house on Michigan Avenue that us elementary school kids walked by every day on our way to Central Elementary School. 
Were the gorgiles in the house? Were, were the gorgiles on the house in those days? I can't remember. Can you? <coughs> As summer fell into fall, it meant we went back to school, and one of those ravines was a shortcut to Radcliffe Field from our high school. It came out facing this very home of Hash that used to be Hartman School. How many of you took that shortcut? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Speaking of Radcliffe, do you know what happened at Radcliffe Field in October of 1949? Well, I'm going to tell you. The city sponsored its first Halloween party there. We attended the free event in our homemade costumes. No one had store-bought costumes back then. My costume was a lavender bridesmaid dress that my mom had worn to her cousin's Chicago wedding. She cut it shorter and made me a royal red cape to go over it. She topped it off with a paper crown. I felt so special. Thank you, Mama. <laughs> my Mama was Connie Tragna de Mori, owner of Tommy's Drive-In from the city's early 60s. The Halloween party was filled with races and games with prizes. I won a whistle. We bobbed for apples. We feasted on hot dogs and taffy apples, just like Apple Annie used to make on the North Beach. We were given cider and popcorn balls that were wrapped in cut right wax paper, tied with curly ribbon. They gave each of us as many apples as we wanted to take home. I still remember the wonder of that fun-filled special evening. So now you see, that South Haven in the 40s, that South Haven in the 40s, was truly the haven it's named for. Well, this concludes the program, but just one final comment. I heard Marietta say that she is, has been used to walking downtown and through South Haven, remembering things exactly as they once were, but she said, the ghosts are now fading. So we hope we brought some ghosts alive for you tonight. So stay there in South Haven.